Good morning. The best short story teacher ever is going to give us a study today drawn from everyday life. That's his style. Come and join with us as we study God's Word together. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. We will be looking at verses 1 through 23. Matthew chapter 13 verses 1 through 23. We are in the 41st lesson of 52 weeks of Through the Bible. We're 41 weeks through the Bible. And we are in the gospel era where Jesus comes forward and uh, presents the gospel. He's writing the gospels right now. We, they are being written as he is going about his ministry. So with that said, we're going to study chapter 13. And it's a it's a lesson that has to do with seven, that's the quantity seven, parables. And we're going to pick the one, the most important one, and the one that is the foundation, follow me on this, it's the foundation by which the other six are built upon later. It's the first one, but it is the foundation by which the other six will be built. Jesus is the greatest, I cannot say it enough, that he is, there, there is none. I mean, I don't care whether you take Mark Twain, whoever it is that's your favorite storyteller, there's not a better, better story teacher than Jesus was. And he used parables to do that. We're going to study that. Now, I use a little bit different style. Last, week, last time I taught, and this time I, ta I teach, I'm going to tell the story first, and then I'm going to read the scriptures. But I want to, I want to tell you what's going on because it'll be, uh, it, I hope there are some of you that have tuned in that this will be the first time in your life you've ever really heard this story. But others will be very mature in it and have heard it many, many times. But I think they're little, little pieces that through God's divine revelation, we will, we will learn anew and, and have a better understanding of what Jesus is talking about and what does Jesus want to accomplish and how does he go about accomplishing it in this kingdom. So, seven, seven parables, uh, and they are uh, applicable to the present age as well as the age in which Jesus was, was roaming about in, in the country of Israel uh, when he was here the first time. And he, uh, he uses an agricultural uh, venue by which he's going to speak and going to tell the story. He, he either used, he, he's so good at it, he used uh, cattle and sheep and, uh, and coins and, and uh, lost sheep and, and fields that needed plowing and thorns and, and thistles and things like that. So that was, the, that was the economy of that time. That was what gross national product was, was the agricultural side of their, they had to do that to just live. So uh, it's, it, it starts, this, this parable we're going to talk, talk about in chapter 13, uh, starts up in Galilee and he's in Capernaum and he's he I, I want to give you background in, in chapter 12 for just a review but 13 he's up in Capernaum he's probably in Peter's home uh, and he's he's leaving the home and he comes out of the house and he uh, gets in the Sea of Galilee and moves his moves his boat out the boat becomes his pulpit uh, there is significance, and I want to emphasize that there is significance to him leaving the house. Because in chapter 12, we have found as he moved through through Judea and up, up not in Judea, but in Samaria and up into Galilee, he has, he has uh, found a lot of opposition. In chapter 12, uh, he, he's going through the cornfields, the men are his disciples, his apostles, 
remember, this is an education. These these 12 apostles are getting their PhDs right now. I mean, they are in the process of getting it. But there are many, many followers too. Some of the followers are there for the food. He has done miracles. They have seen miracles. He's healed people. Some are there for that. Some are there because they've been getting free food. Some are there to see what happens next because he's giving implications and giving, giving great, uh, great, great words to the fact that he is the Messiah and that he is the promised one. So uh, they've been moving through and uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are really getting upset now. They're beginning to really get, get upset with him. He, Jesus finally has to call them you bunch of vipers and uh, and he, Jesus very conveniently, uh, and, and I see it throughout his, his walk, this three and a half year ministry that he's in, uh, that he, he deliberately moves on. When he gets into a confrontation, he, he addresses the confrontation, but then he backs off. I don't mean he backs off with, with his scripture, his, his, his testimonies, uh, his, his preaching, he backs off in that the time is not right for him to be taken into captivity, so he keeps moving. Well, that's how he ended up up in Capernaum. And the, the chapter 13 we're going to be reading today says he leaves the house. I think also he had been, he had been teaching in, the, in the, uh, a lot of synagogue teaching. He had been teaching out in the public. He had given already the uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and people are just following him. By the there, there's literally probably several, maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand people that are following him as much as that all the time now. So he moves out into the sea, and he's going to start educating his twelve apostles as well as those that that the that the the Holy Spirit would fall upon that the that faith would catch hold of them, the word would catch them, and would, would become followers of his. So you're going to see that the scene that I'm trying to set for you, he is on the lake of the Sea of Galilee, and he's preaching. He's now teaching, and he's going to teach it in a wonderful way. The greatest storyteller, the greatest story teacher ever is him. And I believe that with all my heart. I wish I could do something like that. And the, the way he says it, and the, he's, remember you say, but, but Jim, he's, he's God. Well, yes, he's God, but right now he's, he's totally man. I mean, he, he feels the same things you and I do. He, he feels the hurts. He, feels the, he knows that he's being persecuted. He knows that. He knows he's got enemies everywhere. But he also knows that he's doing the Father's work. So many gather to listen to him. Uh, and I want to talk to you for just a minute, a little bit about, uh, Jesus will, it will even in these seven, seven parables that he gives in, in chapter 13, we're only going to study one of them, but the six additional to the one we're going to study, uh, we call it the sower, S O W E R the sower of the seed. And uh, it, it's a good story that has great implications and great, uh, great understanding and meaning and cements to me what he's talking about. And, to, and it should to you too by the time this lesson's over with. So many gather. Uh, he interprets this, this parable, this one parable out of the seven, he interprets two of them, but the others he leaves, he leaves for, for the followers of him through divine revelation to understand. He calls it a mystery, uh, the mysteries of, of these parables, but they're not a mystery to those that are looking to him for his divine revelation. Things are being revealed to me today as a teacher that when I was in my 30s, I was teaching. When I was in my 40s, 50s, uh, I was teaching that I didn't quite understand and I didn't have enough time to dig it out. I asked the Lord sometimes, Lord, what are you trying to say here? And I didn't quite have it together. But I, as, as I've gotten older and more and more, it's being revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. So the same thing can happen to you. You've got to be hearers to be able to, to understand that. So uh, remember that the, that the other six are builders they're, they're on top of the one, the one foundation that we're going to be studying, the sower of the seed. Here, H-E-A-R, is said 17 times to hear, or some form of hearing is said 17 times in chapter 13. Just hearing. And we must hear God's word 
to, to be able to have faith. You've got to hear it first. Somehow you became a Christian through hearing of God's word and faith locked on to you and you locked on to faith. But in Romans 10, one of the sweetest and best things you should memorize, Romans 10, 17, is faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must labor to understand and some of his disciples will come to him and this one, they come to him and say, Jesus, we don't quite understand what you're talking about. Would you tell us? And he does reveal to them the answers to what this, this, this parable is about. Well, what is a parable? That's, that's, a, that's a good question to start with, isn't it? What is a parable? Well, have you ever heard of a, of a, a person that's been trained to be a paralegal? A paralegal person, P-A-R-A, -A, same thing for parable, whether it's in Greek or whether it's in, in Hebrews. Para means to come alongside, to come alongside. So a paralegal would be to come alongside the legal side or follow a lawyer and help the lawyer as he, as he studies and tries to find case law and things like that. So, But in a parable, we are talking about a spiritual, a, a very serious serious word that, that Jesus wants us to understand. So a parable is come alongside the word, capital W. The word is Jesus. The word is being produced right now. The word has been produced in the Old Testament, but Jesus is acting it out. Many of the things that were predicted, the, the prophecies that were predicted in the Old Testament are now coming to fruition. And some of them are going to come into fruition right here in these parables. And, and uh, that's very, very important. Well, uh, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning is one of the ways that I used to say a parable is. But I've, gotten, I've, I've, I've even gotten deeper than that now. So cast alongside, come alongside of the word. Come alongside of Jesus. Understand what Jesus is talking about. In this, in this lesson today, we're going to see three main elements, and then there'll be a fourth one that I want to tag on to that. In this lesson, between one, chapter, uh, verse 1 and 23, verse 23, you're going to see a sower, S-O-W-E-R. And I would ask you, who is that sower? Then you're going to see the seed, the, the, the scattering, the spreading of good seed. And what is that seed? And then the third thing is the soils that the seed lands on. So this soil has meaning. It is, it's not just soil. He's not just talking about the soil. Yes, it's a parable part of it, but he wants you to dig deeper. He wants you to dig deeper. And he's going to tell us what it is in just a minute. But I'm going to tell you before then. So the sower, the sower is God. The sower is Jesus. They are sowing the word. They are sowing the word. What is the word? What is what is the, the what they're sowing? It's the truth of the gospel. It is the truth of Jesus. It is the truth of the Old Testament. It's the truth. Uh, our pastor yesterday had a and Saturday night had a beautiful sermon on the truth and what is the truth, and uh, uh, that, that's very important. The truth is so. The sower is God, and the seed is God's word. It is, it is, we sow seeds of, of the word is what we're doing. And the soils, he will describe four different categories of the type of soil that the seed lands on. Now remember there's four. Three of them, no salvation. Three of them, no salvation. The fourth one, is the good soil. It lands on good soil, and that's the one of salvation. 25% of all the seeds that go out bring back. I wish it was 100%. I wish it was 100%. I pray it's 100%. I, I work with, with, with Dr. Lyons, and he's working as hard as he can to present the gospel to people and to present the word to people that, that, uh, that are interested in hearing it. And our goal is that 100% would come. But Jesus is foretelling. 
Jesus is now telling in this parable that 25% of them are going to hear it and they're going to accept. They're going to hear the word and through faith they will, they will come into it and, and believe it and lock into it. The other three that we're going to study, the types of soil, four types of soil. There's the, uh, the, the, the one is the dirt or walk wayside. Uh, some of the Bibles use the word wayside soil, meaning between every, every row of a crop, there was a hard place where the, where the workers of the fields could walk down. And that gets pressed down and pressed down and pressed down, probably as hard as concrete before it's over with. And so that's the wayside soil. That's the first one that he's going to talk about. The second one that, that Jesus will talk about is the stony soil, the stony soil that some of the seed lands on the stone. Now, there may be a little bit of, this is important. This is, this is not just a casual statement. There may be a little bit of, of dirt nutrient for that seed to grab hold for a season. But then the winds come and the rains come and wash it all away. And he'll have a meaning for it. You're saying, why are you talking this way, Jim, with, with all these different symbols? Jesus will have the answers in just a minute. So uh, the stony seed, uh, takes, it does take root for a short period of time. It, continue, it grows just a little bit, but then the wind comes along and blows it away. What's happened? Yeah, I've seen it time after time. They come to our Sunday school class. They're so excited. They're wanting to ask questions. They'll be there for a season, and then they just disappear. That's what he's talking about. That's the one he's talking about. The third one is the thorny soil that's choked out. It, it chokes out. You get, you get thorns and weeds and the soil, the seed can't, can't live through that. And that's another, Jesus will expand on that thorny soil in a minute. Remember, three, three soils, no salvation. The fourth one is the good soil. It's a converted heart. It hears the word, faith moves in, and he's genuinely saved. Uh, and then there's, there's, there are, he will explain that there are three levels of product, productivity that come out of a believer's heart. And this, this good soil, he will say in the parable, that there is productivity that comes out of the good soil. And what is that productivity? You'll get a hundredfold return. That is, there will be a hundredfold that will come back. That's good. That's great. That's wonderful. That means that, that when I'm saved, that... I possibly could give a hundred percent return to to others that would also follow and and there's a there's a way that Jesus is talking about it. It really has to do with with the uh, fruits of the spirit that that he he's talking about the fruits that are produced by the, this productivity. So one of them is a hundredfold, one of them is sixtyfold, and one of them is thirtyfold. There is no zero. Jesus does not mention zero. If you and I, are, if you and I are saved, you're not going. You you will genuinely, yes, there will be works, and yes, after you're saved, not before. The works aren't, aren't going to get you anything, other than once you become saved, you'll want to, you'll want to do the work. So, uh, J. Vernon McGee said that uh, who, who's a pastor out of California that's now passed on, but I certainly respect him and, and looked at his. Back in the days of Jesus, it was said that, uh, that when you put a good seed in the ground, you could get as much as five to six times return on that seed. That is, your crop would come up and it would produce five to six times as much crop. Today, he, J. Vernon McGee says, because of the fertilizers and the chemicals that, that kill the bugs and things like that, they get at least 10 times uh, the return on that seed being developed, seed, seed coming to harvest. So there is no zero. I, I want to make that very clear to you. Now, what I want to ask you, and, and you need to really seriously uh, look at this as you, as as I say these things to you. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, there are seven fruits of the Spirit. And those are what produce this return, this 60-fold, this 100-fold, this 30-fold. This this 30 
It doesn't re re return no fold. It returns 30, 60, and 100. What are they? And you think for yourself, how am I doing in this? What am I, what am I leaning toward? What do I not lean toward? Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. First is love. Do you have love? That was a hard one for me to come to. In my young life, I had uh, been through some things that have nothing to do with, with this lesson at all. You could care less about, about, about what I went through. But, uh, but the point is that love came hard for me. But God has shown me love. That's the first fruit of the Spirit. When I show love to others, it returns. It, re, it gives me a return. It gives a return, not to me, but to the kingdom and to the person that received that love. There's joy. There's peace. There's long-suffering. There's gentleness. There's goodness. And there's faith. My faith will grow because of the fruit of the Spirit. And if I show that faith to others, they too will will grow and then then that's where we get the the 30 fold the 60 fold and the 100 fold so i hope you understand that uh as as we go on into the lesson today so now i'm going to read from here on you'll be reading god's word i'm reading from the new king james and it's it's in this chapter 13 of the book of matthew verse 1 I, i'm starting in verse 1 on the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. He leaves the house of Peter. I, I, it, the Bible doesn't say what house it is, but up in Capernaum, that's where he made his headquarters. Peter's mother was there. Uh, there there's a whole lot of activity going on around there. And uh, he sat by the sea. He left the house. That, now, that's not just put in in some casual way. I think that means that when Jesus left the house, he's going out and really beginning to He's going to really now, now bring, the, bring the confrontation and the thing that, that the Father has sent him down, that, that God sent him here to earth for, to do for us, to do for me, to do for you. And that is his crucifixion, died for our sins once and for all. He shed his blood. That's, that's the whole, whole gospel. And he rose again. That's the key. So verse 2. And great multitudes were gathered together to him. Remember I said there's, a, there's probably several thousand people. They just want to see what's going on. They want to see the activity. But a lot of them are genuinely, they, they see something in this, in this man. He has the tenfold. He has the twentyfold, the thirtyfold. He has the hundredfold returns that are coming about. So uh, they gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat. He gets into his boat. That becomes his pulpit. He moves out. And I know there's a lot of, lot of preachers that will tell you he probably moved out because of the sound, uh, the carrying of the sound and the acoustics and things like that. But I think he also wanted to move out. And, and he's now going to begin to pour his heart out to the people is, is one of the other reasons that he did it in addition to the amplification of his voice and things like that. He got into a boat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. They're, they're excited. They want to hear his word. Uh, his, his apostles are there. The, the followers are his are there. And there's just hanger oners that are following him too. So uh, verse three, then he spoke many things to them in parables saying, now from here on, we're going to see red letter. When you see, when, get yourself a red letter Bible. That's when Jesus is speaking. His words are in, right in there in the same, in the same venue uh, that, he, that he spoke them. Now, I also want to tell you that, that uh, you can see we're in Matthew, but this same story is told in, uh, in Mark chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 8. If you specifically want to write it down right now, that's Mark 4, 1 through 20, and Luke 8, 9 through 15, in addition to Matthew in chapter 13. From here on, Jesus is speaking. In, in verse 3, Jesus says, Behold, a sower went out to sow. Now, he hasn't told you this is, this is God's word. He's, he's, so far, he's telling a parable, but it has a deep, deep spiritual meaning. Verse 4, and as he sowed, he's throwing the seed out. Now, I understand, and, and again, this is J. Vernon McGee. I'm stealing his thunder here. Uh, but his book tells me that 
the way they, they sowed back in those days is they didn't plow the ground. They threw the seed down on the ground and then plowed the ground after the seed was already on the ground. So as he sowed, he's throwing the seed out. Some seed fell on the wayside. Remember I said walking between the rows of crops gets hardened and really, really gets, gets hard dirt uh, and it packs down. Fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. The birds came and devoured them. Jesus will explain why did he use the word birds and, and, and devoured them. Uh, verse 5, some fell on stony places. Remember I said there's stones in the ground and there may be just a little thin layer of dirt that's on top of it. Where they did not have much earth. They didn't have a good, good, good enough to take hold with the roots. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. There was not enough dirt there. Verse 6, but when the sun was up and they were scorched, these, these young plants, these new plants that are coming up, the crop that's coming up, and because they had no root, they withered away. They're gone and fell among, and some of the seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them out. Verse 8, but others fell, and this is the one you want to key in on, but others fell, other of the, of the seeds, fell on good ground and yielded a crop. Some 100-fold, some 60-fold, and some 30-fold. There's no zero-fold there. They all grow a crop, and they all have this, the, the, these fruits of the Spirit introduced into them that go out and multiply it again. He, he who has an ear, let him hear. Luke says, uh, uh, how you hear is the important thing. And Mark, I like the way Mark said it. Take heed what you hear from here on. Take heed what you hear is what Jesus is saying. Now, now Jesus in, in verse 10 will begin to develop what the answers to this are because his disciples don't quite understand what he's talking about. They need help. They're not quite there yet. They're not mature enough yet to understand it. And remember, he's pouring a PhD. These men are fishermen. They are, they are great men, good, good men. My son has an electrical contracting business and he has electricians working for him. They are the greatest group of men. Most of them have been with him 20, 25, some of them 30 years that have been with my son. And they are masters in electrician. They've got their PhDs in electrical. Well, Jesus is giving his PhDs to his 12, 12, disciples, 12 apostles. And those 12 apostles are going to carry on because Jesus knew he's leaving this earth and he needed them to be, be fully educated on, what, on what, these got, what the gospel is and what, who Jesus is and how you, how you get salvation. And the disciples came to him. This is verse 10. And the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus again is going to answer in 11. He answered and said to them, red letter from here on, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them that have not been given, that it has not been given, for whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. When you don't get it, you're going to lose everything. You think you got it. You think you're living a good life without Jesus, without God, without even wanting to darken a church, wanting to, to know more about Jesus. You haven't seen it. You think you got it now. You're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. This mystery is a spiritual truth. This is what, this is what Jesus meant when he said, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It is a spiritual truth which is understood by divine revelation. It's understood by those that are on the inside, that have the faith, that are growing and studying the Word. As I said earlier, please remember what I said with regard to 
Things were not revealed to me when I would read the Word when I was a young man. I, I would try, but I didn't quite have it. And I would study and study. And as I've studied more and more and more, each time something gets revealed to me new. That's why we need to hear the Word. You don't need to hear this parable one time. You need to hear it 25 times, 50 times. The whole, the, all the Gospels that way. So it is a divine revelation understood by those on the inside who learn and obey the word of the Lord. That's how it, that's how it works, my friends. So uh, verse 13, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Verse 14, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, now Jesus is going to quote from the book of Isaiah, this book of promises from Isaiah. So many promises, so much prophecy of what's going to happen in Isaiah. And he's quote, Jesus is quoting Isaiah himself in the Old, from the Old Testament. This is 700 years before Jesus came. But here's what Jesus is saying. Now listen to this. Hearing, this is Isaiah's word on, in uh, Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. Hearing, you will hear and shall not understand. Parable, parable, parable. And seeing, you will see and not perceive. Verse 15, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their hearts are dull. They have not accepted the word. They don't want to hear the word. They may come to church because mama dragged them or on Easter they may walk in the church house and they're sitting there and saying, when is this going to be over with? So for the hearts of the people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have been closed. Uh, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts in turn. So that I should heal them. So that I should heal them. Who is that I? That I is the biggest capital you ever did. It's Jesus shall heal them. Some are hardened. So words do not even make an impression on them. It gets snatched away. Hear, but they fail to act. Gradually become calloused, and they get, they get away. They get blinders on their eyes, my friends. Remember the fruits of the Spirit that we've been talking about. Verse 16, Jesus is still speaking red letter. But blessed are your eyes, that you, for you see... He's saying to the, the apostles that are standing there with him, saying, we didn't understand. He said, blessed are you because your eyes you see and your ears, for they hear. Most 17. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see. Who are they seeing? They're seeing Jesus in action. They're seeing Jesus in act. Those prophets of the Old Testament. We studied 39 weeks of the Old Testament, my friend. If you go, go back to Dr. Lyon's uh, YouTube site, you will find that in that 39 lessons, we have been in the Old Testament. Time after time after time, the prophets, the righteous men, all desired. They knew the Messiah was coming. Think of what David knew and his dynasty and will live forever. His And... and Jesus is now saying they desired to see what you now see and did not see. They didn't see it. And they desire to hear what you hear. You're hearing it. You're learning it right now. And, you, and they did not hear it. Verse 18 to 23, Jesus is going to answer what each of, the, what each of those symbols. Remember I said, what is, who is the sower? Who is, what is the seed? And what is the soil? Jesus is about to answer that. Verse 18, Jesus is speaking. Now, for, now therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. In other words, the person hears the word, but the distractions, the, the hardening the hardness, there's no penetration, and the devil likes to snatch it away. It's, it, it, the heart conditions vary. And this is he who receives seed by the wayside. That's, that was the first one. Verse 20, but he who received the seed in stony places, 
This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it. He, he comes into the church. He's so excited. He, he joins everything he can join. He gets involved. This is what Jesus is talking about. Immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself. He's not saved, my friends. He's excited. He he's, likes the music. He likes the, the storytelling. Yes, the storytelling is great. The storytelling is great. The history is great. But really, that's much, it's much deeper than that. Don't, don't think you open the Bible for the history. That's a byproduct of it. And it's nice because it proves who, who God is and Jesus is. And there's not a single fallacy in that, in that book called the Bible. But at the same time, we don't need to do it for those reasons. We do it to learn more of how to be fruitful and how to, to use that fruit for God and how our faith can be grown by hearing the word over and over and over again. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. He, he, he then leaves the church. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. He's gone. Verse 22. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and cares of, the, of this world and deceitfulness of riches. He, he's more, more impressed with making it today, make, you know, getting, getting murdering, I mean, not murdering, but mowing down the competition and becoming number one. Those are the things. That's all right, but put God first. Put God first. It chokes the word and he becomes unfruitful. He's no longer, he's not able to even, even bear any fruit. He never, had, he never had salvation to begin with. Now we talk, verse 23, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. Who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold and some thirtyfold. Remember, no zero no zero fold. That's a heart and full surrender, my friends. They hear and understand, uh, and they they want to 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 use the fruits and multiply it for God. It is. Uh, I, I couldn't help, but I couldn't turn loose of a of a scripture that I know about and you know about when I say it. It's in Acts. It's Acts chapter eight, verse thirty four, and we'll be through with the message after this. Uh, there were the, the apostles were busy preaching the message, teaching the word, and they needed assistance. They needed needed uh, people that were servants for the Lord. Those are the deacons that they joined. They joined. They 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 appointed seven deacons. Two of them we know tremendously. We know pretty pretty much a lot about them. One of them's name was Stephen, who was stoned, and the other one is Philip. Philip is up. He's up in uh, up in the northern part of of Judea, and uh, he's been once he's a deacon, he's out preaching God's word and helping every way he can, helping primarily serving tables and things like that. But later on, he'll go on up into Galilee and and uh, have a church up 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 at Caesarea. But right now, God says God sends sends a message to to. Philip and says, go down to, to, to Gaza, the Gaza Strip down in that area. And I want you to want you to trust me, go down there. Well, there's a as he gets down there, there's a Ethiopian eunuch that is that is leaving Jerusalem, headed back to Ethiopia, obviously. And he's, he's got an entourage with him and he uh, is stumbling with with words from the Bible and uh, and he can't, he doesn't have the answers to it. And God put Philip right there at the time and place. And Philip says, how can I help you? And, and the man says, what does this mean? He leads the, the Ethiopian eunuch to, to follow Jesus, to, to believe in Jesus. And the man says, well, why can't I be, be baptized right now? And Philip says, Nothing stopping you. Let's get you baptized. So, the baptism did not save him. Don't think that it is the it is faith coming into him. He heard the word. Philip was using his fruit, and it was being multiplied. That's the multiplication. 
then that Ethiopian eunuch will be a better man and will be able to, to develop his own faith and develop the word, and then he will multiply also. So to sum up today, the devil does whatever he can to make sure that the word does not take hold in, in, in people. That's what the devil's trying to do. Next week, you're going to have a great another parable, another parable. Dr. Lyons is going to, going to it's, it's a wonderful story. It's called the prodigal, the prodigal son, and you will enjoy it very much. So remember what, what parables all are about. God bless you. I'm glad you tuned in today to see us. I hope it cements into your heart and you go out and use your fruit too. Thank you.